In the fifth episode of the original series of Star Trek, the show tries to pass off what is clearly someone's dog with a horn taped to its head as an alien life form. It's pretty hilarious to revisit, not just to see the actors make a heroic attempt to stay in character while carrying this thing around, but also because this unicorn dog doesn't seem distinct enough from life on Earth to make a believable alien. But this raises an interesting question. If there is life elsewhere in the universe, just how alien will aliens look? It's a question many scientists and sci-fi authors have speculated on, and is a fascinating rabbit hole to go down. So, for this entry into the archive, we'll explore relevant phenomena in evolution and physics to determine if extraterrestrials are more likely to look like Earth animals or something far stranger. For our first example, let's start by imagining an Earth-like planet. It's got a comfortable amount of liquid water, a protective atmosphere, and plenty of carbon to form the building blocks of organic compounds. If life emerges on such a world, what kinds of ecosystems will form? One of the most important phenomena to consider when imagining extraterrestrial life is something called convergent evolution, or the independent evolution of similar features across different species despite being part of different evolutionary branches. It's why echidnas and hedgehogs look almost identical, despite one being a marsupial and the other a placental mammal or why hummingbirds and hummingbird hawk moths are often mistaken for each other, despite their last common ancestor predating the first land animal, or why crustaceans simply refuse to stop evolving into crabs, a trend we'll discuss more in just a bit. With all these examples, it feels like nature is copying its own homework and not changing things enough to get away with it. But evolution isn't a conscious force, though we often think of it that way, is the product of random genetic mutations allowing certain members of a species to better survive and pass on their genes, resulting in change over time. And a trait that benefits one species might also benefit another in a different time or place if they face similar obstacles. One of the best examples of convergent evolution is how sharks, a type of fish, dolphins, a type of marine mammal, in ichthyosaurs, a type of extinct marine reptile, all evolved the same general body shape despite coming from vastly different lineages. They all have streamlined bodies, tail flukes, and dorsal fins that are in roughly the same place. This is particularly remarkable for dolphins and ichthyosaurs, as neither of them started off with any fins at all. As is often the case, the main reason for this seemingly miraculous convergence has to do with physics. Simulations have shown these body shapes are the optimal way of moving through the dense medium of water. So, natural selection encouraged parallel attributes in each lineage, with the three animals essentially finding similar solutions to the same problem. So, on a habitable alien planet with liquid oceans, perhaps we'd find life forms with the same general body plan swimming beneath the waves. A more extreme example of convergent evolution is how crustaceans just won't stop evolving into crabs. I told you we'd get to it. The number of times different lineages have independently converged on a crab-like body plan is so high that there's even a word for it. Carcinization, meaning to become crab-like. Today, there is a staggering array of these crab mimics across the globe, from the tiny strawberry hermit crab that feeds on seaweed, to the coconut crab that looks like it feeds on your nightmares. I've made jokes about carcinization before on my channel, because there is something oddly hilarious about the phenomenon. Are crabs just the pinnacle of evolution? What is it about the crab body shape that makes so many unrelated crustaceans seemingly jealous enough to copy their style? Well, once again, physics is our culprit. The long tails of crustaceans like shrimp or lobsters can restrict the species' mobility. By contrast, the compact crab shape is efficient and versatile, with few exposed parts that predators can get to without getting pinched. So, there's nothing mystical about why the crab body plan is so trendy, though it's fun to think so. It's simply a good answer to the question of survival and likely would be on other Earth-like planets as well. 
But these are all examples of convergence in species that already have a lot in common, like eyes, legs, and a skeletal structure. If microbial life were to emerge on an Earth-like planet, would it really end up evolving these structures? In his book, A Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy, Cambridge zoologist Eric Kirschenbaum reflects on how certain features, like eyes and limbs, might be more common across extraterrestrial life than we'd think. The eye might seem like a unique feature aliens wouldn't necessarily converge upon, but on our planet, eyes are thought to have evolved multiple times across different lineages. Eyes likely emerge from rudimentary photoreceptive organs, which some life forms on Earth still possess, and then through natural selection become more complex over millions of years. Yet across these variations, eyes always serve the same essential navigational function. And on another planet, a creature's chance of survival will also likely be higher if they can see where they're going. So, if the first aliens we encounter end up having eyes, it won't be that surprising. The same can be said for legs. On Earth, arthropods and vertebrates evolve legs independently from one another after emerging from the water. While the shape and number of legs might fluctuate, the mechanical advantages legs offer are likely to be universal across Earth-like planets. Even more fundamentally, practically all animal life on Earth exhibits cephalization, or the concentration of the mouth, sense organs, and nerve ganglia on the front end of the organism producing a head region. Cephalization is likely the simple result of the advantage that having the part of the animal that goes forward be the one fitted out with sense organs. And on most planets, it'll likely always be more important to know where you are going than where you have been. Even plants convergently evolve. Trees, that is to say, large photosynthetic life forms protected by a bark-like substance, have emerged many times from many different plant lineages. And the evolution of fruits like apples happened independently from fruits like tomatoes, with both of these shiny red fruits emerging to get the attention of animals that disperse their seeds after chowing down. Likewise, seed dispersal by ants has evolved more than 100 times and is present across more than 11,000 plant species, making it one of the most dramatic examples of convergent evolution in all biology. Yet convergent evolution doesn't always produce organisms that look the same. Take, for example, the woodpecker, a kind of bird, and the eye, -eye a kind of lemur. Both of these animals occupy the same basic role as predators who feed on insects that hide within trees. Woodpeckers get to these insects using their beaks, and eye eyes get to these insects using their elongated, somewhat unsettling finger. In terms of their lifestyle, these animals are quite similar, but you'd never mistake one for the other. This means that even if an alien occupied a similar niche to an earth animal, there's not always a guarantee they'd look alike. So, on our Earth-like alien planet, we might find mobile animal-like organisms with eyes and limbs moving around stationary, plant-like lifeforms, occupying niches that are familiar to us. But they might still appear pretty distinct from Earth life, and certainly aren't likely to look like the Star Trek dog. Still a majestic creature, though. But what about the possibility of aliens with intelligence comparable to ours? Would they evolve a convergent form on an Earth-like planet, or would they look entirely different? The question of what intelligence even means could probably be its own video, but for now, let's keep things simple. Returning to Star Trek, Spock is certainly a suspiciously humanoid extraterrestrial with an appearance identical to humans with the exception of elf ears and funky eyebrows. This was more the result of budget constraints than anything else, but it's a trend you see across a lot of science fiction. And while it's easy to assume that an intelligent alien would look like we do, that's not necessarily the case. Human hands might seem like a tool perfectly designed for crafting technology, but our hands didn't originally evolve for manipulating objects. The digits we use to work our smartphones began as a means to better grip onto the trees we used to swing through. Aliens would probably need complex manipulatory appendages to create technology, sure, but that could take any number of divergent forms. 
Likewise, our bipedal stature might seem ideal, but ask any orthopedic doctor what they think of our spines and you'll realize the human body plan has some definite drawbacks extraterrestrials might want to sidestep. Of course, some things seem likely to be universal across advanced life in the galaxy. They'd probably need a large brain, right? Well, that might not even be the case, as crows have relatively tiny brains, but are able to solve logical puzzles and use simple tools. Their dense brain structure means they actually have a similar number of total neurons to that of primates, and indicates that alien intellects really might not need to resemble the human form after all, unless they also happen to evolve from a primate-like species that began walking upright. With all the planets in the universe, intelligent humanoid aliens aren't impossible, just not all that likely. But it's time we address the fact that not all planets are the same. An Earth-like level of gravity, for example, isn't a constant throughout the universe. Our planet's gravitational pull is an invisible yet crucial influence across evolution on Earth affecting the parameters of animals' body plans, maximum size, and behavior. So on a planet where gravity is, say, significantly weaker, evolution might take a very different path. One of the best depictions of low-gravity alien life comes from Sam Velas Boas's speculative work of Planet Anu, which I've covered before on the channel. This evolutionary thought experiment depicts extraterrestrials that take advantage of their planet's weak gravitational pull in a variety of ways, with many having tall, spindly bodies that wouldn't be able to carry their weight on our planet. Velas Boas does imagine some convergence with Earth life would take place on such a world, but there's also a variety of life forms our planet could never support. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the possibility of alien life evolving on a world with a stronger gravitational pull than our own. Christian Klein's speculative field guide to alien life, The Teeming Universe, which I've also covered before on this channel, gives us a look at a high-gravity world occupied by heavy, slow-moving life forms. On the fictional exoplanet Borold, Klein imagines aliens that creep slowly across the ground like giant terrestrial starfish, their bodies built to withstand over three times the gravitational forces we experience here on Earth. And dissimilar gravity isn't the only variable that might make life on exoplanets different from what we're familiar with. Remember how I mentioned alien life might have eyes? Well, on a planet with an opaque atmosphere where energy comes not from a sun, but say, geothermal vents, you might see a world of sightless creatures. On Earth, many deep-sea creatures either have undeveloped eyes or no eyes at all. So, it makes sense that on an alien world with very little light, there wouldn't be much point in having light-receptive organs, and organisms might navigate through their sense of smell or through advanced echolocation. And even if a planet's surface is inhospitable, maybe some organisms could thrive in a planet's atmosphere. Returning to the teeming universe, there's a section of the book that outlines the possibility of life emerging in the stratosphere of a planet somewhere between a terrestrial world and a gas giant like Jupiter. The chapter depicts extraterrestrials that float on sacks of internal hydrogen, steering themselves through the air on specialized fins. The possibility of life within the atmosphere of a gas giant has been entertained by numerous scientists over the years, including Carl Sagan. When considering evolution on planets different from our own, extraterrestrial life becomes less and less familiar. And things could get weirder. Different planetary parameters aren't the only factor when considering how alien extraterrestrial life might be. So far, we've been assuming alien organisms would have similar fundamental chemistry to our own, but that might not be the case. Crystalline life based on the silicon atom, instead of carbon like life here on Earth, has been a topic of discussion among scientists since before the 20th century. Since silicon-based bonds are most stable at high temperatures, such life might theoretically thrive on planets with high geothermal activity. Even if we visited such planets, we might not recognize them as full of life at a glance, since such ecosystems might seem barren to our eyes. 
Now, more recent studies have shown there are some potential chemical pitfalls to silicon-based life. But it's difficult to disprove such a theoretical concept with any certainty. Who knows, maybe somewhere out there in the universe, a silicon-based scientist is working on an article about how carbon-based life just isn't possible. In fact, some Earth animals have been observed using silicon in their structures. Diatoms are tiny phytoplankton that encase themselves in a wall made of silicate. Now, these organisms aren't silicon-based, but they do show the material's potential to be used in biological life. And why stop at silicon? Scientists at Cornell University have modeled a theoretical oxygen-free cell based on methane that could be the basis for some really unusual life forms. Protected by a cell membrane called an azotosome able to withstand extreme temperatures, these hypothetical cells could potentially survive on exoplanets with weak atmospheres. And going to the most extreme scenario, it's possible there are life forms that our limited view of the universe hasn't prepared us for. When it comes to extraterrestrials, we don't know what we don't know, and maybe our definition of life will prove too limited in the infinite variations of the cosmos. So where does all this leave us? Well, the truth is, we can't definitively say what aliens do or do not look like without ever having met any. We can make inferences based on evolution on Earth, but with a sample size of one, it's difficult to say how much we really know about how life tends to emerge. With so many planets, it's not a leap to imagine that some alien ecosystems would be somewhat similar to Earth life, while others would be completely different. So, if you're a world builder or writer who's worried their fictional creatures are too similar to Earth life, remember that nature itself isn't always completely original. And if you're worried your fictional life is too out there, remember that we are only just beginning to discover what's possible. Maybe one day we'll find an ecosystem much like our own. Or an ecosystem that stretches the definition of life. Or maybe we'll just find a planet full of crabs. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.